Hello, hello everybody. Thank you very much for coming. This is what we're going to do. We're going to spend half an hour listening to a discussion between Baroness Moyo and myself, and then we're going to open it up for your questions. And then after the event, those who have books that they would like to have signed, and Baroness Moyo has very kindly said that you would do so. Thank you for being here. Thank so you. who is Dambisa Moyo? She's a famous economist. She is a very effective corporate board member. She has been one of the very few people who have been able to live in this intersection between theory and practice. She's an inspiration and recently she was elevated to the House of Lords. In fact, her CV is perfect except for one little detail that I'm gonna to come to in a minute. She was born in Zambia, did a master's at Harvard, then somehow lost her way and ended up at that other place <laughs> to do a doctorate, but we're gonna forgive her for that. Um, she worked in the corporate world at Goldman Sachs. She worked in the multilaterals at the World Bank. She serves on a number of boards. She has best-selling books. I've lost count of how many books in all now? Uh, only five. Only five. <laughs> and the list goes on. And she is an inspiration to many, many people. So, Bernard Smoyo, let me start with your background. So, born in Zambia, you go to school in Zambia, and then suddenly you find yourself in the US. What happened? So first of all, I am absolutely thrilled to be here. Um, I'm always excited to come to Cambridge. Um, I know, I'm sure I'm going to be hung, drawn, and quartered at Oxford for saying that, um, but uh, it's been a thrill over many, many years coming to, to Cambridge, and I'm delighted to be here. Thank you so much for hosting me. Um, so what happened? Gosh, it's uh, it seems like uh, such a Complicated question, but in some sense, so simple. I was born and raised in Zambia, as you pointed out. Um, and actually, I still consider my formative years, primary, secondary school, and part of my university education to, to be um, really defined by my uh, time in Zambia. Um, we, my father decided to pursue a PhD in the United States at the University of Wisconsin. So the family moved to the United States um, when I was around eight years old. Um, just sort of fast forwarding to the you know many joyful years of living in Africa um, and uh, you know enjoying the many aspects of living in a dynamic developing country which had gone from the colonial era to independence and was struggling to figure out you know what sort of economic system would work what sort of political system would be suitable for such a nascent economy. Um, I look back now, and it, you know, it, it, I'm sure it's in the history books that you read, but for us, we, it was a lived reality, glasnost and per perestroika, um, you know, the statist economies. This is coming out of the uh, Bretton Woods in the 1940s and thinking about the important and central role that government plays into structural adjustment into the 80s, where the world had decided that too much government is challenging and uh, you know, we needed less government, and we sort of switched, and, the, you know, all these different things um, that we take for granted now were really a, a lived experience um, growing up in Africa. Um, unfortunately, in 1991, we had a coup, attempted coup, which was the overthrow of the Zambian government. I was a student, like many of you here. I was actually in my final year of university, and the university was shut down. Um, and, uh, you know, interestingly, the, um, the reason for the coup was uh, food prices. Um, so very familiar today in terms of inflation and the things that we're dealing with. But I was a student and um, there had sort of two things had happened. One was food prices because the World Bank had pursued a policy of uh, getting rid of subsidies. So prices uh, went up quite dramatically in Zambia. But the other issue was that um, 21 students um, at the university of at that time Zaire, which was our next door neighbor country, had been killed by the government for demonstrating for a democracy. And so we, as a good young students in that day, we downed our tools and decided to go and demonstrate. And so our university was also shut down and this created 
uh, the, oh, you know, attempted overthrow of the Zambian government. Um, in any case, the university closed for about a year. Uh, I lost about seven months of education because we were waiting to figure out what had happened. There was a lot of chaos uh, in the country at the time. And at that moment, I, I was uh, um, very fortuitously uh, given a scholarship to complete my studies in the United States. So that's the abridged version. And, and during that whole period, do you remember when your interest in public policy, in economics, in politics, when did that start? Well, so by, just by a show of hands, how many people come from emerging markets in the room? So quite a number of you. So 90% of the world's population lives in the emerging markets. I'm not sure if you guys are aware of that. And so um, for many people, and I don't know if people have the same experience, but you know, living in the emerging markets, the, the delineation between economics and politics is quite blurred. You, it's a lived reality, as I said. You know, the, the notion that prices rising in the supermarkets would immediately lead to demonstrations and the political near overthrow of a government is very commonplace. I mean, you can see what's happened in Brazil or in Argentina or in you know, Thailand and many other emerging markets around the world. And so for me, there wasn't a moment in time. I grew up in a very, very uh, sort of um, uh, very uh, active household of debate. Um, we used to have vicious arguments at dinner about the importance of uh, you know, democracy. And my parents grew up in the colonial era. They were much more uh, sort of uh, one party state people back in the day, they wanted to have a strong leader who was going to lead them not just out of uh, colonialism, but be uh, sort of a very strong leader in the new era of Zambia. Um, and so it wasn't sort of a moment in time. That's, this is how I was raised. We had a lot of economic debates, a lot of politi political debates. Um, and, um, and so I, for me, that intersection between the, the, uh, the NGO sector, which is huge in, in many poor countries, but especially in places like Africa, um, where they, they do a lot of policy uh, interventions like political parties, um, that interplay was just sort of motherhood and apple pie for me, sort of growing up. So within that, that interplay, there is a constant theme, at least I think there is, in your work, um, which is the emphasis you put on growth and on human well-being, human prosperity. So it's, it's so fascinating to me because um, I look back and I think probably the attitude towards economic growth, to my mind, changed in about 1999, 2000. Um, I think at the, the, the time of the battle in Seattle, you and I will remember because we were sort of, uh, sort of conscious at that time. But the, the fact of the matter is the World Trade Organization demonstrations in Seattle, to my mind, were really a turning point in people's attitude towards the notion of the pursuit of growth. Um, and I think we've lost a, a lot of the rationale of why growth is important. Um, and just to be clear, and I, I make this point um, even recently in, in my House of Lords maiden speech, I made the point that we need to have 3% growth per year in order to double per capita incomes in a generation, which is 25 years. So put differently, if we want to see improvement in our living standards in the next 25 years, we have to be growing by 3% per year. And if you look around the world today, very few countries are reaching that number. Now, why does growth matter? Growth matters because governments need the tax revenue. We need to be able to, um, to fund innovation in healthcare, in you know, all aspects of science, education. Um, but we also need, uh, I strongly believe, we need uh, the economic growth so that we can create a middle class that can hold government uh, accountable. If we have governments, which many places in the world do, um, that are dependent or that are um, sort of catered to Western donors or donors of any sort, Chinese donors, then they can very easily dismiss the wishes of the local population. And that's a very dangerous um, situation to be in for democracy but it also sort of severs the sacrosanct nature of the contracts between the individual and their government. Um, now, I just want to be clear. I'm not saying that growth for growth's sake is, is, uh, is, a, is a laudable pursuit, and nor am I saying that uh, we should you know, not think about the fact that we've had multiple years of growth and we've had massive inequality or that there are enormous consequences in terms of the environment that we have to calculate and think about. We have to do that. But I think this attitude of being anti-growth 
um, could leave us in a very, very dangerous place where we're not able to satiate some of the basic public goods, um, as I said, education, healthcare, national security, infrastructure, that are really going to help us not only be competitive um, against other countries, but also are going to be very important for us to continue to see human progress and improvements for the next generations. So that's how I came across you the first time, um, in a book. The book about development aid, which at the time was quite controversial. Were you surprised by how much controversy that book triggered? I was, and I still remain quite surprised. I mean, I have to say, when I went to Zambia, and I'll tell you in a minute, for those of you who aren't familiar with the book, um, that when I went home um, to Zambia, uh, to, and I said, oh, you know, there's all this controversy. I'm about to get, I'm getting run out of town because I wrote a book about uh, critiquing aid. Um, a lot of people in the emerging markets in general were like, what's the big deal? It's like, isn't this obvious? Everybody knows this. And essentially the critique um, in Dead Aid was that if fundamentally, we can do better. Um, we, we, at that time, we'd had about 50 years of aid programs. These are large programs um, of capital money that goes from wealthy countries, wealthy multilateral institutions, to poor countries. Um, just to be absolutely clear, I'm not talking about emergency aid. Um, when, the, when the tragedy that we saw in Turkey happens, or in Mozambique, or wherever it may be in the world, we should act um, as, as, as being interconnected as global citizens as we are. So I'm not talking about that, nor am I talking about NGO aid. Um, that's probably another book. But uh, I think NGOs um, have, you know, they have an effective purpose in, in certain uh, aspects. They can be also, uh, you know, if you listen to some policymakers, they can be quite challenging and, to work with. But fundamentally, opening up a well in Kenya or in Thailand is not really what I'm talking about. I'm talking about systematic billions of dollars that go from rich countries to poor countries. And there's a whole host of reasons that it's problematic. I won't go through all of them. Um, reasons of inflation, a lot of money coming into a small country, uh, reasons of Dutch disease, the economists in the room will know, you know, causing an appreciation of the local currency, which can kill off exports, um, reasons of political uh, um, sort of uh, uh, sort of undermining the political contract, as I mentioned earlier, if the African government, Zambian government doesn't need to care about the Zambian people because they're getting paid money from somewhere else, that's a problem for democracy. And then, of course, corruption. Um, but perhaps most problematic, I would say, um, with aid is that um, it leaves a lot of countries vulnerable and dependent on donors. And in fact, the situation we're in right now is exactly what I was mostly worried about, that we would be in a situation where poor countries are relying very significantly on their government fiscus on foreign donors when the donors themselves start to be economically challenged. Um, I think it's it's insane that the U.S. government, uh, you know, right now has got a massive debt problem. Um, but you know, same with the U.K. But in the U.S.'s case, China is the largest foreign lender to the U.S. government, and yet we're expecting the U.S. to give aid to, to foreign countries. Like that cycle, just I think as humans we can do better. So that's essentially uh, just one more thing, if I may, just to say that um, you know, in all my books, the formula is actually. Uh, uh, sort of, in a sense, boring because it's predictable. But I always give a critique in the first half of the book, and the second half of the book is solutions. Because I think we can all navel gaze and get negative, but I think that's not really helpful for where the world is. So I won't go into the solutions, but I did propose some very tangible solutions to why, how we can replace the aid system in an effective way that's actually sustainable and that actually has uh, evidence in historical context of working. So, so how does someone with all your interests in public policy, end up at Goldman Sachs? Very easily, actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, because I'm at Cambridge, you'll, you'll perhaps appreciate this. I don't know if they still do milk runs. Do they still do milk runs when companies come through and they sort of try to tempt you to join? Okay, great. So you'll know what I'm talking about. So I was a student at Oxford doing my doctorate, living my best life, had never heard of Goldman Sachs, had no idea what they did. Um, but I was hungry. I was poor. I was just saying I couldn't even afford to be a, a member of the uh, uh, Oxford Union. And you somebody didn't, you didn't miss much. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> By the way, just to give it a plug, 200 years of Oxford Union this year. So free speech, all that. And they haven't learned yet. <laughs> okay. Um, but in any case, um, a good friend of mine said, hey, what are you doing this evening? Do you want to come to this um, free food event? It was what it was pitched to me. as so it was a milk run event with Goldman Sachs. And I was like, who? And there's a Goldman Sachs, whatever. And they say, 
why don't you come along? And I, so I went and I had very tasty pizza and uh, wonderful drinks and then heard about this organization. And I think you know, on a serious note, the point is that um, on the question of economic growth, which has fascinated me for several decades now, um, I realized that private capital was another piece, the financial system from the private perspective was another piece of this equation. I had been raised in Zambia, I've been quite familiar with the role of government in Zambia in providing, as I said, those public goods. Um, I had worked at the World Bank in Washington, D.C., which is multilateral donor-based uh, public funding of um, a lot of those public goods. And here I was in this room um, hearing about how the, uh, the, there's a financial uh, infrastructure, um, you know, Goldman Sachs being one piece of it that was also playing a role as a, as a lender to governments, um, but also as a lender to multilateral institutions. And that was another piece of that equation. And, uh, you know, I, it's been, it was fantastic. I was there almost 10 years. I, I really enjoyed um, being there. So in those days, especially, Goldman was dominated by white men. What was it like coming in into that world? So I guess um, someone told me a long time ago that if you're more the only person in the room, they'll definitely remember you. So I thought that's actually a great way to think about it. I mean, I could have taken the woe is me approach, um, and I know that some people might find that to be quite effective. I just never did. Um, I think what was uh, perhaps... Uh, what I, I needed to make sure I managed well was that um, that I made sure that I was going to get feedback and opportunities and people were not going to feel uncomfortable with giving me critical feedback that I needed. And I think that's the, the bigger issue. I mean, of course, um, there are issues of, is there imposter syndrome? Do I feel insecure? Am I the only person here? And nobody wants to feel that way. But I think um, if, you, if we spend too much time not realizing that our uniqueness actually adds a breath of fresh air. I mean, when we went to see clients to pitch for um, opportunities in, when I went to Israel or Turkey or South Africa or the United States, the clients always remembered me. Um, they didn't really remember the other members in my team. At least they, they were always like, oh yeah, what was that, that woman? Because it was, it was such a, an, an oddity. Um, thankfully, that's changed uh, con in, a, in a considerable way. But I think the more important thing for us as individuals is when we find ourselves in those situations, we have a, a responsibility to, uh, to ourselves. But I think it's important to remember that we're not owed feedback. And if we don't create an environment where people feel like, hey, you know, you're good at this, but you're not so good at that. If we can't create an environment where we can get critical feedback, we lose. Um, and I think that was a bigger takeaway for me at Goldman Sachs than anything. Um, you know, we're in a transition. I still find myself very often in rooms where I'm, I'm the only person. I mean, the House of Lords, I think we've got about 27%, somewhere between 25, 27% women. Um, I can probably count on one hand how many people are of my race. Um, but um, again, I go there and I use it more as an opportunity. I don't think about downside risk. I think about in the opportunity to um, set my stall, to offer a new perspective that people might think of and not think of. And, uh, and I, think, I think the more we can think about more silver linings for these clouds, I think the more effective we can be. So after Goldman and after establishing yourself as an economist, many companies came to ask you to be on their board. And you got so interested in it that your last book is about effective boards, which is a very important aspect of governance in a market-based system. You identify five critical issues for the board. Can you tell us a little bit more about those? Gosh, okay, so let me see if I can remember them all. <laughs> I wrote the book during the pandemic. Um, so, well, first of all, just to be absolutely clear about the role of the board, I think it's important because um, Again, because we live in this world now where it's sort of anti-capitalist, anti-growth, I think there's a risk that even corporations, the value, the utility of corporations has come under threat. Um, and so I was very keen, not just to rush and talk about what, how important boards are, but really to talk also about the role of corporations, warts and all. Um, and I've been very fortunate. I've sit, served on boards of companies that have been around for 360 years, you know, Barclays Bank or Chevron, 150 years. They've gone through multiple transitions, energy transitions. They've gone through recessions, through wars. How do they think about surviving um, through these challenges? So some of the things that I talk about um, is really about looking ahead, thinking about the war for talent, a more siloed world. I mean, you will be familiar with the fact that we're living in a world that's got much more deglobalization, 
than certainly the world that we've lived in in the past 50 years. Um, there's much more uh, sort of us versus them. So China is forming a new sort of uh, uh, sort of anchor, a new uh, pol a polar as aspects between um, the West and, and the rest. Um, so how do we think about uh, managing businesses, global businesses in that world? Will we be able to repatriate uh, you know, uh, profits? Will we be able to hire people from different countries? How do we think about um, not just capital moves, but managing technology? If you're a global company based in London, but you have operations in Singapore or in uh, Zambia or in, in Chile, how do you think about running those businesses if the world is becoming more siloed? So that was one aspect. Um, technology, not just um, downside risks and thinking about cyber, but also thinking about how do we invest into AI and technology? What, what does this really mean for productivity and for canonical models of economics? So you know, I talked a lot about that. I talked about um, things like uh, thinking about uh, climate um, issues and ESG, um, very important. I mean, it's interesting because I think even the term ESG has become a little bit outdated and no, no longer fashionable because a lot of the issues around environment, social, and governance have now becoming so much more embedded in the raison d'être of being, uh, of being a, a global corporate citizen. So um, I don't think in any way uh, that these corporations are there, um, but we certainly are um, very attuned. If you think about the 1970 article by Milton Friedman and where we are in 2019 with the business roundtable challenging what the role of the company's utility is moving away from financial shareholder to more broad stakeholders, I think that's uh, another big piece. And then maybe I'll just leave off with one more, um, which is also, you know, what is the role of the corporation when you have very large stakeholders um, in the form of institutional investors? Um, so, you know, there's a lot of research out there that organizations um, that, are, you know, like State Street or Vanguard um, have large positions in, uh, in publicly traded corporations. And so the question is, d does that pose a problem for how companies behave? Are we basically making good judgments for all shareholders or are we swayed in one direction or another because of certain shareholders? So those were some of the themes that I picked up um, and, and raised um, as being real issues that we deal with there. So, so among the latest failures, corporate failures, if you look at the US banks that failed, um, there was always the question, where was the board? And part of that question was, where were the independent directors? That's right. Were they not overly influenced by management, by the chair, and didn't ask questions, and therefore developed structural weaknesses that exposed the company to vulnerabilities that ultimately brought it down? Right. And so how, how risky is this model where management and the chair of the board end up defining the agenda for the board and the independent directors are, are just like sheep? Well, I think there's a more fundamental question. I mean, I, I haven't had the experience where um, the board has been, quote unquote, like sheep. I think, and, and just to be clear, I've served on boards now for about 12 years. I have been on boards where the chairman has died while in office. We had, in 2016, the biggest takeover. I was on the board of SAB Miller. It was the biggest takeover that year for $100 billion who were taken over by Anheuser-Busch. Um, I was the chairman of the risk company, uh, excuse me, risk committee in 2016, um, where I, as the chair of that committee, said, there's no way we're going to have a vote on Brexit. And even if the craziest thing happened that we did have the vote, there's no way we're going to vote to leave. Um, a lot of the positions that we put on in terms of capital allocation risks and processes and just the management of the company, they, they bought into those assumptions. And guess what? I was wrong, um, as were other board members um, who, who had sided with me. We thought we misread the, the mood music. Um, I've been on boards where um, we've had to fire the CEO. Um, I've been on boards, I mean, this is in 12 years, we've had a pandemic, we've had a financial crisis where literally you think the company is going to no longer exist. So there are lots of challenges. And one of my board colleagues who's, who's in his late 80s once said to me, you know, Dan I just want to tell you something. The one thing about life is that you're always going to be surprised. And in a, I know that sounds kind of trite, but I think it's a very, for me, I've used it very much as a good uh, sort of compass 
in thinking about how we manage these businesses because there's a risk that you think too much about risk management. Oh my God, if I'm always going to be surprised, I better not do anything. I better stay in cash or stay, you know, in a very, very safe environment. But that's not the point. Um, whether it's government or NGOs or corporations, we should be leaning in. We should be investing into the future, but that that takes risk. Um, and so I, d I don't actually agree with this notion that that somehow the governance is is, uh, is sort of static. I think there's so much uh, dynamism in how we think about um, the relationship between the chair and the CEO, between independent directors. I've seen so much evolution um, over time that uh, I, I think it's too simple to say that, that was one problem. Now, having said that, I do think there's a bigger issue um, of concern from the um, Silicon Valley Bank takeaway. And this is probably quite risky for me to say it because um, I'm sure it's going to be misconstrued and uh, snippets are going to be uh, taken out of context. But I think what we can see from, um, from certainly looking at the board member biographies is that there was a lot of good intention to have diversity in the boardroom. But I think that what had happened is in some instances, not all, um, there were people who were put in roles, both in management as well as on the board, who had no qualifications on how to risk manage a financial institution. And I think that is a problem that we have to, we have to think about. There, as far as I'm concerned, given where we are in society today, we don't need to drop standards. Um, there are enough women, minorities, um, there's enough diversity, different backgrounds, um, whether it's religious, sexuality, origin, etc. There's so much talent out there that we should not be driven to um, fill seats just because we are under pressure from institutional investors or from what uh, society, how society is going to judge us. It's our responsibility to say we absolutely support and want more diversity. That is good for us um, to succeed, but uh, at the same time, people have to have the qualifications. And I think if you look at the qualifications of a lot of the executives who were charged with running that risk book, as well as a lot of the people who were on that board in particular, they really were not qualified. So I could go on asking questions, and I have many more, but I'm not. I'm going to open it up to you. With, but with one final question. You get a text, you get an email. What happens when you get elevated to the House of Lords? Do they call you? I mean, do you read about it? You know, how does it work? Tell us, take us behind the scenes. Well, I'll tell you what. Um, people ask me all the time, how did you get into the House of Lords? And I'm like, it's the most opaque system I've ever seen because there's no like, oh, let me just download the form and fill in my application. There's nothing like that. Um, I will not bore you with the details, but I will tell you that I got my first phone call in November of 2021, and it was sort of one of these secret phone calls where even though it's the phone, um, you, even you crouch over because you're like, what's going on? But somebody telephoned me. I was, happened to be traveling in California. And um, somebody said to me, oh, you know, you're telephoning, just wanted to know, this is that, you know, at that time, Her Majesty the, the Queen was still alive. And they said, just want to be absolutely clear, this is not an offer. This is, do not get any impressions that you're going to get anything. Um, but we're just wondering, in principle, would you consider this? Of course, I, I, I tried to pretend that I was being high maintenance, um, like it's a first date. Um, <laughs> But actually, I uh, immediately said, hmm, I, th I, think I, I think I could consider this. Um, and then I didn't hear anything for like nine months. Um, I drove my husband mad. Um, I was like, you know, what's going on? And I couldn't talk. And of course, they swore me to secrecy. And then I didn't hear anything. And then I heard again. And then they said, well, you know, we now want to move it to the next stage. And we have to do all this vetting. It's going to take at least three months. Um, and again, just because we're vetting you doesn't mean you're going to get it. Anyway, um, between, in those three months, we had, you know, three prime ministers, uh, the queen died, um, you know, well, it wasn't three months, but sort of six month period. And I was certain, drove my husband absolutely insanely mad because again, I couldn't tell anybody. Um, and wasn't really sure. Now tell you, and then the, the sort of leaked into the press. And the funny thing about it, looking back, is that there were about eight names that were sort of rootling around. And I found out one of my very dear friends, who's a Cambridge grad uh, a historian, um, was also, his name was rootling around. So now I had somebody else I could call, not drive my husband uh, to despair. Um, and I realize now, looking back, about half of the people 
who must have been called and must have been vetted, um, actually never ended up in the Lord. So I realized when they said to me it was not a guarantee, they really did mean it. But my great sadness is that the queen um, died before I was elevated. So I'm in the first class of the, the king, which is fantastic, don't get me wrong. Um, but uh, I just received my final seat. I wish I had brought it. Uh, you have to invite me to come back. It's this ins- uh, spectacular box. And in it is this enormous seal, and the seal is the seal of the queen. So um, I guess I straddle the queen and the king. It's a long-winded way of saying I have absolutely no idea how uh, I, I was considered shortlisted or whatever, but um, I'm delighted to be in there. It's been We had an amazing debate yesterday on the immigration bill, um, and uh, it's been super thrilling so far. So I know I said that was my last question, mm-hmm. but please allow me one more. <laughs> Given that various leaders and central bankers were fooled to talk to President Zelensky, who wasn't President Zelensky. When you got the phone call, how did you establish it was a hoax? Um, you know what? This is, it's so interesting. I will tell you, I was just saw somebody today at breakfast who also fell for one of these hoaxes. I think you, you just don't get too excited. Um, I, I, but did I you didn't establish say that it was did yes, I, I did establish that it was authentic. But then when I didn't hear anything for the next nine months, I was like, wait a minute, was that a hoax? Okay. Um, but um, yeah, well, hopefully the seal was a real seal. I'm going to go put my <laughs> bite it today and make sure um, that it's real. No, I think it's yeah, real. No. <laughs> okay, let's open it up for questions. Go ahead. Thanks so much for speaking with us. Um, so I'm actually going to intern for the World Bank this summer. Fantastic. And, uh, so it's interesting to hear the critical view of these multinational institutions. Uh, so I'm curious, you know, have you seen significant change since you wrote your book? Do you still feel like these are there, there's the, the same critiques exist? Um, how would you kind of update the book if you were to update Dead Aid, for example? So great question. First of all, congratulations. Um, I think it's brilliant going to the World Bank. I enjoyed my time there very much. I still have a lot of great friends there. Believe it or not, after I published the book, they invited me to go and talk about it, which I think is a healthy um, attitude, um, especially since uh, you know I grew up in one of the recipient countries. You might want to know what I think about uh, these aid programs. So they were very open-minded about uh, inviting me. But um, look, as my, my view changed, it's a great question because... Um, Fundamentally not, um, but it's it's for perhaps for different reasons. With the fact that we're in a world now where the donors, as I mentioned earlier, were, are in a very strained position, really leaves a lot of vulnerability uh, in the uh, in the system generally, but also for countries um, who are dependent on that on that aid. Now, but having said that, there are a lot of positive things. The fact, the mere fact that they invited me to come and talk about the critique, I think, was very helpful. The World Bank itself has published, and in the book I cite research that came from the World Bank, really citing weaknesses in the aid programs, whether there was sort of uh, what percentage ended up going into corruption and, you know, thinking about administrative costs. So they themselves are familiar with some of these arguments. Um, And I think, you know, overall... Um, I would not. I think there is a role for multilateralism and multilateral institutions, and but I, I think like everywhere else, like whether it's corporations or NGOs or inst- university institutions, they too just needed to upgrade um, and uh, and innovate. In what ways? Um, the world has changed dramatically in our time. The role of developing countries, um, you know, particularly countries like India, which is now the largest population in the world, China, um, GCC, the Middle East. I mean, these are important places in the world, and they, I think they, the more those views are represented, even if they are not the views that we subscribe to as our values, I think it's really important for us to hear those. And I think there is much more of a movement to, to hear that and to understand understand that. So I, I wish you so much luck. I really enjoyed my time. I'm still, you know, I've got lots of friends there, and I, I've spoken there a bunch of times. I think there's a lot of good work that comes out of there. Other questions in the back? Um, what are your thoughts on CBDCs and their undeniable encroachment on civil liberties? What is CBDCs? I don't know whether Central that. Bank, oh, okay, because I mean, one has to be very clear these days because uh, you know I, I heard CBD in the US is uh, something to do with marijuana or something. So just to be clear, this is CBDC, Central Bank Digital Currency. Fantastic. The of talking about. This. Got it. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I honestly, even in the Lords, I'm like, please don't use acronyms because what you did, what you say might be received as something different. So yes, digital currencies. 
Look, I, I am um, a big believer in innovation, um, fundamentally in innovation. And you know, by all accounts, um, we are in the middle of a, a very large technological innovation period. I mean, you're hearing everything about AI in general, but I think specific to digital currencies, there's been a lot said and done. And I think there have been a lot of mistakes as well. Um, but I, I'm, I'm quite optimistic about where the world will land. And I think the problem with um, uh, some of these issues is that there's a lot of trial and error that's required. And the pro problem with trial and error is that it's costly. Um, you know, FTX, I was just looking today at, uh, uh, at the Vision Fund, which is really touted and focused. I don't know if you saw this today, but it's one of the big funds from SoftBank. They just talked about $32 billion worth of losses. These are enormous losses and have an enormous second order effects. So do we need more um, work to be done? And I think a lot of work is being done, um, certainly in places like China, but also in the, the UK, as well as in the US um, around digital currencies and what the role of a central monetary authority um, is. I think, yes, we definitely need that work. Um, but I would definitely not say that we're anywhere near um, an answer about whether or not this is really going to be the, the launch pad for, for the future. Um, to take it on. Yeah, go ahead. Do you believe it to be a, an encroachment on civil liberties, the installation of such a thing? Well, so I know that argument. Um, I, you know, what I, I should have said early on, I'm not the sort of person who lands in corner solutions. Um, I, I, you know, I think, I, I, I don't know what kind of person would sit here and say yes or no, because it's, it, we don't, I just simply don't know. Now, is it a question that we should think about and we should explore 100%, but uh, I, do, I don't think I can a priori say to you, yes, it's absolutely an encroachment or no, it's not. So I think it's a great question, but I think one of the things that worries me quite a bit about debate, not just about uh, um, digital currencies or the role of multilateralism or monetary policy in that, um, or for that matter, any of the big issues, climate change, uh, immigration, growth, is that we are, we are more and more pushed to having a yes or no answer for things that are just incredibly complex. Systems are complex. And so um, I know it might be wholly dissatisfying uh, in the here and now, but I think in general, um, I would say I know the arguments. I'm open-minded. Um, I think we need to think about those and debate those issues. But at this stage, I cannot tell you in, in categorically it's one thing or the other. Thank you. There was one in the front here, then we'll go to the back. Um, I'm Daisy, I'm from Kenya, and so I'm excited to hear about your story coming from Africa and making it here. Um, my question is on the development of Africa. Um, the, I think also Wild Bank statistics say that in the, in the next 20, 30 years, the African population is going to be the highest in terms of like young people or people in the workforce. But the problem is that there is a skill gap and there's also like a technology gap. So even though there'll be a higher population, if this gap is not filled, then you still have a lot of people, but then the GDP will not grow. What do you think we can do right now as Africans to prepare ourselves for the future? Because we cannot keep saying that we depend on the West. We cannot keep talking about what happened during the, during the colonial period. We cannot keep talking about the government and corruption. At some point, I feel like you, get, you, have, you have to get to a place where you say, okay, now we need solutions. We have to stop complaining all the time. What is your view on how this can be approached in a way that is sustainable over the long haul? Well, I think uh, I can now rest easy um, because I, I think you have articulated the fundamental problem, but also solution, um, not just for Africa, but for the emerging world in general. Um, you know, one of the uh, tragedies of um, getting to a, a period over 50 years old, um, as I am now, I'm 54, is that you look back and you think, oh my gosh, I remember being in my 20s and feeling like, hmm, actually if we just traded more together or if there was more education, if there's more healthcare, if there's more infrastructure, things would be better. Um, and I remember many years ago seeing a uh, cover of The Economist magazine, I think it was the cover, it was something, it was definitely in The Economist magazine that said um, potentials for 12 year olds. And one of the tragedies of being in your 50s um, is that you start to hear rep repetition of stories, like you know, people saying, oh, we need to build more infrastructure, we need better health care. And it's not just about Africa, everywhere. We need more. You know, we need more services, and you realize that, despite everybody knowing 
what we need to do, we're failing to execute. Um, I'm going to tell you something very quick, which is tangential in a way, but it has the same aspects. Um, when you are elevated into the House of Lords, you have to deliver a maiden speech before you're allowed to speak in the chamber. And I just gave my speech on the UK government budget um, on March 16th, which was incredibly nerve wracking, but um, was also very helpful because it was just it was just sort of 12 minutes. But the first thing I did, I thought to myself, you know what, I want to talk about growth and I want to talk about driving for growth in the future, and much as I've hinted to you here today. And I said, but before I do that, I'm going to go into Hansard. For those of you who don't know, Hansard is basically the library of all the legislation and history going back centuries in the UK. And I said, I'm going to go back and see what other eminent economists who've been in the House of Lords said about growth. And I went back, and you'd be amazed. I think, I think it's actually publicly accessible. And you, it's worth just fooling around with it. It's very interesting. I went back centuries and I realized, and I wish my husband were here because he would tell you, I went to bed so sad that day because I realized that everything I wanted to say about the importance of growth, the role of it for infrastructure, for education, et cetera, had already been said. It had been said a century ago. And what became very clear to me is that it's not that we don't have ideas, it's that we're bad at execution. And I'm afraid to say and I don't want to make this about Africa, because I think Africa is just one problem that is, is replicated. I mean, everything you've just said about the young skill gap is true in the UK, it's true in China, it's true in the United States, and it's risks getting more exacerbated in the technological era. But our problem is not a lack of talent. Our problem is not the lack of ideas. Our problem is the lack of execution. So how, can I, how do I leave you um, not despondent as I was that night um, before I, I delivered my maiden speech. Um, my advice to you is do your best, do your part for trying to execute. Don't just talk, execute. Um, this is why I said to you earlier, my books are not just sitting around and navel gazing and being negative. It's also to say, here, I'm going to help you give you some ideas on what we might do better. I'm not saying I know the answer because I don't, but I think You've got to lean in in a positive way to say, I'm going to execute. We're going to actually do something and not just talk about it. Um, I know that, again, uh, I'm sure um, President Al Arian is going to scold me for being sort of a bit negative, but that's not the, I'm not trying to be negative. I'm trying to encourage you to, to understand that if you go back in history, centuries from in the past, you'll find that a lot of the ideas that you might think um, when you're in your 20s and 30s are new, are actually not new. And what has been uh, the greatest failure for humanity is uh, our inability to execute. So whether you decide that the execution needs to come from multilateral institutions like the World Bank or from Goldman Sachs or from being in politics, um, whatever you do, just lean in and make sure that you're not just there identifying problems, but you're there really thinking about solutions. And I'll leave you with this one last point about thinking about solutions. Um, more than anything, my strong advice to you is um, do not be ideological about your solutions. We don't know the answer. The fact that we are living today and the number one and number two largest economies, the US and China, have two very different political systems. One is democratic, one deprioritizes democracy, and two very different economic systems. One is market capitalist, one is state capitalist, but they have roughly the same Gini coefficient, which is a measure of inequality, should make us curious, should make us wonder, how is it India, biggest democracy in the world, um, has a per capita income sort of 10 times less than China, um, which is about the same size in the population. We should be curious and we should be open-minded about how we solve these problems. Living in the era in which you find yourselves, there may be ways to accelerate some of the, the solutions that we couldn't do in our period because it would be too hard to scale. So just be open-minded, but do not be caught in a corner where you're so ideological, this is the way the world works, this is the way it is, because I think those are the things that have really hamstrung not just Africa, but I think the world and a lot of the issues that we face today. That's wonderful. We have a question all the way in the back, standing up. Um, Firstly, thanks for coming back to my like, On the topic of growth, the UK has had like, a pretty rough go of it in the last sort of, decade and a half. Things like the housing crisis, productivity not moving since 2008, um, you know, GDP per capita being lower than the financial crisis. 
And yet, like, we don't really talk about growth as a political concept. The only time the government... Were you here when Liz Truss was prime minister? <laughs> <laughs> the one time when the government, like, dares to go for growth and make growth a big agenda, it collapses after six weeks, right? So how do we, one, get people to start talking about growth, and two, sort of overcome the political blockages and the inertia that stop, like, actual economic growth happening? So um, let me just frame your question a little bit, if I may, because I'm sure there are a lot. There may be some people who are interested in economics and economists in here, but just to help us understand what we're trying to achieve when we think about um, economics and, and growth. So growth is really a function of three things. Three things drive growth: capital, which is how much money you have. So things like debts and deficits are really influencing that capital question. Second thing is labor. So it's the quality and the quantity of the workforce, your labor force. Um, and I'm sure many of you will be familiar that as we the population ages, um, the issues around immigration that we debated in the House of Lords yesterday, uh, questions about skill gap, uh, skill gaps, uh, education, etc. They fit into that labor question. And then, as you rightly pointed out, the third thing is productivity. Now. I'm shorthanding it here, and I'm sure, again, Mohammed will wrap my knuckles later. But roughly speaking, um, the first two variables, uh, uh, capital and labor, represent about 40% of why one country grows, another one does not. The other thing, this factor, total factor productivity or productivity, represents 60%. So getting productivity right is really important. For the last 10 years, in developed countries in particular, large economies like the UK, productivity has declined. Um, and the interesting thing is, so what is productivity? It's about how we can convert labor and capital into growth. Why is it that we've been a unable to get past that 3% number that we, I talked about earlier, if we really want to drive growth? Um, we can spend hours here talking about why it's been a problem. There are lots of debates back and forth on this productivity puzzle. Um, but, but it's particularly annoying because we're living in a period of, again, of technology where you would expect that the fact that I can um, spend a fraction of the time um, writing a paper or um, telephoning my mother in, in Africa means that that speed, that improvement in speed um, should make us grow faster. But it's precisely the opposite. We're actually seeing a decline in, in growth. So you say that, and just that, so that's a, a framework, and there are other things that go, I should say, other things that go into productivity, rule of law, democracy. There's lots of studies, lots of work that's been done for, you know, many people have won Nobel Prizes um, looking at this, uh, this question of productivity and, and growth, as, as I've uh, outlined it for you. But you're asking me why it is that, uh, you know, there's not enough more attention to growth. And the, quite candidly, um, I think part of, and I hinted already why uh, um, growth, I think, has had a, a, quite a negative reaction. There have been some mistakes in terms of uh, who wins and who loses, um, particularly in, in capitalist societies. And we know that there are a lot of populations in uh, places like the UK, but also in the US, that have lost out um, during the globalization era. Um, there's a lot of studies, a lot of data that shows that the best, the greatest beneficiaries of globalization have actually been the owners of capital and not of labor. You know about real wages declining, et cetera, people, and even now the threat of job losses um, in a technological area era is very, is very live. So I think um, all of this is to say that I think growth is on the agenda, um, both in this country, both Sir Keir Stam as in the opposition, but also Rishi Sunak have talked about growth. But it goes back to the Daisy's question. Um, the question is how, how are we going to get growth? How do we think about not just um, in my what I would say? How, not only should we think about investing in the traditional public goods, but how are we going to manage the risks that are really massive headwinds to the growth picture today? Um, I've been able to talk about growth here without talking about climate. Massive, massive headwinds coming from the climate uh, um, um, uh, climate uh, change issues and an energy transition. Inequality, how are we going to manage to make sure that um, we don't have more people demonstrating or on the streets because economically they're, they're not getting access to housing? Um, you know, thinking about uh, um, the public policy and the growth question, it's always about trade-offs. 
we can't do all things for all people. And yesterday, the number of, uh, it was very interesting, something that was in some sense quite isolated and ring fenced, a debate around immigration, brought in questions about housing. You know, how do we think about housing in, the, in light of being, wanting to be compassionate um, and a morally upstanding country? So um, again, I'll leave you with one last um, economics model. Uh, it's the guns versus butter model, which is to say, you know, we can't, we, if you, and many of you will, uh, you're smiling, so I think you know the curve, but basically we can't be a society that only has butter, you know, a euphemism for food, because we'll be invaded. So we need to figure out how we protect ourselves. But at the same time, we can't just have guns to protect ourselves because we will starve, um, we won't be able to uh, feed ourselves. And so economics and public policies constantly about those trade-offs, um, thinking about can we actually move society forward, um, but at the same time um, uh, not lose anybody. Um, if I, I, I know we're probably going to run out of time, but I just want to also um, give you a, a sort of live question, because I think growth is, it's very rare that I meet people who say, oh, growth is such a bad thing. I think people can be skeptical, but by and large, people understand that we need it. But I will say that the role, um, as I've gotten older, I've become much more sympathetic and empathetic to the role of public policy because it's incredibly difficult. If you get 100 pounds and you're the government and you know you have educational needs, you have healthcare needs, um, and you have infrastructure needs, I'll just pick those three. What is the right proportion that you spend on that 100 pounds? Do you spend all the 100 on healthcare? Because without, if you don't have a healthy population, nobody's going to go to work, nobody's going to get educated. Um, or do you spend a third, a third, a third, in which case maybe doesn't really set the country on fire in terms of really giving it a boost for growth, but at the same time, at least you're sort of, not, I don't want to say manage decline, but you're certainly uh, sort of managing um, society. And, and these are the real questions. How should you parcel that 100 pounds? Um, and in a time when uh, we've had a pandemic, we've had a lot of economic uh, financial crises, um, and we've had a lot of uh, political turmoil. We have a war on our shores, uh, not too far from us here. Um, I think all of those things um, make it much harder, even with best intentions, to drive growth. So it's a bit more complicated um, than perhaps you would have liked as an answer. But I, I think the point is just to say that there are systems, we're in a system, whether we like it or not, and despite all intentions of trying to deliver growth, it becomes extremely complicated when you're quite constrained um, from, from a policy perspective. So unfortunately, we've come to the end of the hour. So let me conclude by going back to Daisy's question and generalizing it. What do you say to people in this room that are growing up and going into the next phase of their life in the context of a climate crisis, inflation, too little growth, too much debt, and worsening inequality? I, I would say two things. Um, first of all, please, please, please travel. Please travel. You're so fortunate to be living. The Wright brothers did the work for you. They created planes. <laughs> you know, it's not always cheap. And yes, we, ha we should be c very concerned about um, climate, et cetera. But please travel. Um, use planes, trains, automobiles, go and travel, go and see the world, go and see how other people live. You will find that there's a common humanity um, and that your ideas will be challenged. It's very important. You cannot stand, whether it's in the House of Lords or running a college, and, and think you know the answer without having been exposed uh, in this world to other ideas and challenge and really think about those. So that's the number one point. The second thing is we need a lot more humility. And I think the humility comes from going back in history. Um, as I pointed out earlier, it's very satisfying for our egos to think, oh, well, you know what, I'm not like my parents. You, we all think our parents never used to sneak out of the house to go to the nightclubs, but actually we know they did. Um, and I think it's very satisfying to think, oh, we're young generation, we're different. Please go back in history. Go and learn about... Um, Adam Smith and economics. Go and learn about previous um, challenges to the status quo, not just wokeism. It's not new. We've had McCarthyism. We've had the Salem witch trials. Uh, we've had prohibition. Go and look at how public policy um, has failed or succeeded. Go and think about how the NHS, NHS came to being. 
Why did it come to being? What are the challenges? I mean, we talk about the challenges today, but think about the context, think about the, the backdrop. Um, yeah, we have uh, centuries, multiple centuries of history to draw on, not just here in the UK, not just from the United States, but from countries that go further back, like China, go back into places like India or you know, uh, in Af many African countries. And I think ignorance is incredibly dangerous, particularly in such a volatile world. And I think there's a lot more, um, of course, temerity, but also a lot more humility that's required. So those are the two pieces of advice. Travel widely and go and read history books. Um, you will be, I think, quite astonished to hear what our forefathers dealt with um, and uh, you know how they navigated the world through world wars um, without mobile phones um, and how they thought about um, making sure that there was a platform for us to, to continue to exist today. So those were my those are my counsel to you. Thank you. Please join me in thanking Baroness. <laughs>